came to the brink of nuclear war. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. Spying played a crucial role in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, with nuclear arsenals many times more destructive, nations ask if sophisticated intelligence tools can help keep the peace. Spy technology has advanced dramatically. But just how much can we depend on modern espionage and its high-tech spy machine? Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And by Allied Signal, a technology leader in aerospace, electronics, automotive products, and engineered materials. might at first seem to be astronauts preparing for launch into space. In reality, they are modern-day spies. Pilots of the world's fastest and highest flying aircraft, the SR-71. It is but one spy machine in America's vast intelligence network, which is always listening and watching, taking full measure of the world. This spy plane can fly higher than 80,000 feet, at over three times the speed of sound. It reportedly can outrun any plane or anti-aircraft missile in existence. The missions these pilots fly are secret, but they are reported to have ranged from detecting China's first atomic bomb explosion to surveillance of Nicaragua today. It is a practice repeated throughout history using the view from the high ground to gain an edge over an enemy. A century ago in the Civil War, the Union Army tested hot air balloons and cameras for aerial reconnaissance, but dodging Confederate bullets made for blurred photography. The need for getting above the battlefield was never greater than in the trench warfare of World War I. The first solution was to once again march out the balloon, now elongated and thin for stability. But it was still an easy target, especially for another new invention in the sky, the airplane. The airplane became famous for aerial dogfights, but its first mission was reconnaissance. Many planes carried cameras. They were bulky, heavy, and sometimes held by hand. But the results proved worth the effort. Military planners called for more and more photos. By the war's end, millions of images. But it was not until World War II that aerial reconnaissance came to the forefront. One of those responsible for America's effort, retired General Elliot Roosevelt. We were woefully lacking in the techniques of intelligence gathering. For instance, in my field, which was aerial reconnaissance, uh, we went into the war with absolutely the crudest idea of aerial reconnaissance and what could be garnered in the way of information. We learned it all from the RAF and the British. In 1940, the battle for the skies of Great Britain. The British pilots were badly outnumbered, but they had a secret weapon, a technological breakthrough called radar. 
This electronic means of gathering intelligence revealed the precise location of incoming German planes. The British also had forewarning of many of Hitler's war plans thanks to cracking the secrets of the German Enigma machine. This machine encoded many German command messages that were thought unbreakable, but it was beaten by another machine, the newly invented computer. U.S. Navy codebreakers proved just as resourceful in the Pacific, painstakingly building a copy of a decoder they had never seen to duplicate Japanese codes. Magic, as it was called, yielded a rich harvest. By December 1941, American leaders had intelligence warning of a possible Japanese attack somewhere in the Pacific. On December 7th, a last-minute decoded message revealed that the Japanese were breaking off diplomatic relations, a sign that the attack was near. But Washington failed to alert military leaders in the Pacific in time. Harbor was America's greatest intelligence failure. But later, American leaders came to rely heavily on magic. Its information proved decisive in the carrier battles of Midway and Coral Sea. Some Allied military leaders credited the codebreakers with shortening World War II by at least a year. What did end the war was the atomic bomb. But as the war ended, relations between former allies grew cold. The Soviet Union was soon perceived as America's new enemy. And we were incredibly ignorant about military events, especially within the Soviet Union. And there were two types of information the United States wanted to get. One was targeting information information about military facilities in the Soviet Union that would be attacked in the case of war. The second was early warning information, being able to detect Soviet military moves that indicated an attack on Europe or the United States. But Stalinist Russia was shrouded in secrecy. Obtaining information became a major effort of the newly created Central Intelligence Agency. Dino Brugioni, a World War II aerial photographer and one of the CIA's first employees. One of my first jobs was to create uh, files of industrial installations in the Soviet Union. So I became an expert in the Soviet Union, but having flown photography, I uh, knew that the Germans had flown reconnaissance over the Soviet Union. So I managed to get a lot of that photography into the files. In September 1949, a reconnaissance mission over the Sea of Japan brought back air samples containing evidence of radiation. The Soviets had exploded their first atomic bomb. America's nuclear monopoly was over. In the rush for more intelligence information, the CIA recruited photo specialist Arthur Lundahl. And I said, now wait a minute, I don't know anything about you guys from CIA. If you think you're going to parachute me into Trieste or something like that, forget it, because I'm no 007. Lundahl was asked not to jump from planes, but to supervise America's expanding photo interpretation effort. Most of the photos were taken from slow-moving planes of World War II vintage. During the next 10 years, more than 40 American aircraft and nearly 200 crew members were lost over or near Soviet-controlled territory. There were aircraft missions, uh, mostly U.S. Air Force, very brave men who skirted the Soviet Union, taking long-range oblique photography across the borders and then trying to get away before they were shot down. Sometimes they were shot down. The headlines were big. The major industries and things we were looking for were not along the borders. They were in inland. So it was not a satisfactory program. You had to get inside deep to find what we were after. Desperate for information, the CIA resorted to a civil war technique using balloons. High-altitude skyhooks like these were sent aloft to drift across the Soviet Union, randomly taking pictures along the way. Most were shot down or lost. The few recovered brought meager results. Tensions heightened even more during the summer of 1953 when the Soviets exploded their first hydrogen bomb. President Eisenhower, worried over the threat of a thermonuclear Pearl Harbor, proposed open skies. 
each country would be allowed to fly freely over the other for military reconnaissance. No one wants another Pearl Harbor. This means that we must have knowledge of military forces and preparations around the world, especially those capable of massive surprise attack. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev rejected the proposal, calling it nothing more than a bad espionage plot. Uh, George Kistiakos, the late George Kistiakoski, uh, President Eisenhower's science advisor, told me um, that we were dropping spies into the USSR, and in Kistiakoski's words, they were being liquidated virtually as soon as they hit the ground. So it was very, very frustrating. Uh, imagine being in 1954 and knowing that they are, that they've got nuclear weapons and that they say they're building all these things and not knowing for sure. So you have to know for sure. How are you going to know for sure? You're going to try and fly over them and look down and take pictures. The spy machine to take those pictures was already being built, tucked away in a corner of Lockheed Aircraft, a corner called the Skunk Works. In overall charge of the program, the CIA's Richard Bissell. We knew that we were going to need a a secure location where flight test and development could take place. And we identified a location in Nevada that was perfect for aircraft operations, smooth as a billiard table. The plane, called the U-2, was like no other aircraft built before. Part jet and part glider, it became the single greatest intelligence accomplishment of its time. I think one of the great hidden stories uh, since World War II has been the fact that intelligence has been enormously important in creating new forms of technology. The U-2 is a very good example. In the early 1950s, it was thought that you could not get a plane to fly uh, above 70,000 feet. It was nearly impossible, uh, or if it was possible, it would take practically 10 years to develop. Eight months after the go-ahead to build the plane, the U-2 was in the air, shattering altitude and distance records. Uh, it was well described as a, as a power glider. Uh, I can make the point by illustration. I was sitting in Washington one afternoon and received a telephone call to the effect that a U-2 on a training mission over the central United States, and specifically over Tennessee, had had a flame out at altitude. That is to say, the jet engine had ceased to function. The pilot was able to, had sa said, he was going to glide back to New Mexico and land at Albuquerque, which is precisely what he did. The plane's payload was a massive camera with a specially designed telescopic lens, a lens so powerful it could spot a golf ball from a height of eight miles. New, thinner film allowed for thousands of photos to be taken. The U-2 could map the entire landmass of the United States in less than a dozen flights. The 4th of July, 1956, Wiesbaden, Germany. The U-2's first penetration of the Soviet Union. A daring overflight of Moscow and Leningrad. I told uh, Alan Dulles that the aircraft was airborne and where it was going. His reaction was exactly like your question. Uh, is it really wise to go over the two largest cities and presumably most sensitive locations in Russia on the first flight? And I said, well, the first flight is almost certainly the safest flight there'll be. Although beyond the range of Soviet surface-to-air missiles, the U-2 pilot was far from safe. The plane itself was full of traps and danger. Well, you were asking a pilot to climb into a terribly cramped cockpit. He was deprived of food and water for uh, up to 12 and 13 hours at times. Uh, he had to keep a uh, terribly close watch over a number of controls to, to keep this plane level. It takes, uh, needless to say, a great degree of steady nerves. Colonel Charles Stratton, pilot of the U-2 for 18 years. We all accepted the fact that it certainly didn't have some of the very best equipment that a lot of our airplanes did. It didn't have uh, backup systems for a lot of things. Uh, the early on airplanes didn't have ejection seats. It wasn't extremely difficult to fly as far as actually flying it was concerned, but you had to constantly be monitoring and paying attention to what it was doing. The stall was by far 
the worst situation to be in. You just flat could not stall it up there. The first flight over Russia was a complete success. Four.